All right, guys, welcome. I guess we're here at the scene of, of what was the Controlled Chaos Classic this weekend. Yeah. Um, postponed, rescheduled, a um, little sneaky I training session. I guess the shell of the Classic. Yeah, so um, I guess a bit of a, a statement of the times at the moment, right? Um, we're joined today with a, our first live audience, which is unbelievable. There's yeah, a bit of a cheer. Yeah. <laughs> So there's about 10 people here, which is double the amount of people that usually listen to the podcast. <laughs> uh, so we're all kicking goals. Our guest today is Erica Yamasaki. Um, the first thing I want to do is apologize. Um, I haven't done a heap of research coming into this. Oh, um, okay. with the, I usually try to do a lot, of, a lot of reading up and a little bit of intel and um, try to pick up on a few segues of conversation. But um, given the week that it's been, Josh actually contacted me on Tuesday night and was like, hey, I think you should still come down on Saturday because Eric is going to be down here. And um, she's agreed to do the podcast. So thank you so much. No worries. Um, the thank few things I do know, it's our pleasure. Um, your name seems to whisper around weightlifting gyms, competitions, or you're almost like Eric Yamasaki. Hopefully all good things. Um, <laughs> the term pocket rocket gets used a lot, I've noticed. <laughs> um, definitely, you know, you have a number of fans. I think Josh, every time I speak to Josh, like, you got to interview Eric. you got to talk to Eric. You're going to love to have I'm her such around. a fan. Yeah. Um, so I think maybe that might be, you know, like a, a really easy place for us to start. Um, is and Josh, and if you want to kick us off, like, how did you guys meet? How do you guys know each other? Um, what are you doing down here at Control Chaos, <laughs> etc.? Um, well, I, I guess like um, we kind of met through the weightlifting platform. Um, I just shoot a couple messages through um, on Instagram, and um, what maybe six months ago, yeah. if that, um, as we were kind of getting started and um, asking some questions and seeing what's happening with uh, with the comp competitions and competing and stuff like that. And then um, obviously I knew I was running the Classic and I wanted to get some um, some bigger name lifters to come down and, and lift for us. And so I asked Erica and she was more than happy to come down and, and have a lift, even though um, her competitive schedule was pretty packed out uh, leading into the Olympics. So very grateful that you were able to come down and, and thank you very much. But yeah, it's pretty much how we met, like we don't really know each other that well, but still very grateful that you came down. And I know for me, like, you know, just to have um, someone who wants to share their interests and their passion for weightlifting and um, spread the word, like that's always really something exciting for us in, who are involved in weightlifting, because uh, it isn't a big sport. So, yeah. um, and for me, like when weightlifting platform came out, I just wanted to really get behind it and um, support it as much as I can, because I know that, you know, uh, Australia's not, massive on it just yet so um as a you know one of the female lifters um it was like important for me to support that kind of um thing that is happening like that's going to promote my sport so yeah it's exciting that's probably a good way to get into it because i know a lot of the conversations we've had you know in terms of weightlifting is it is still quite an obscure sport um too many that are external to the community um, so that might be a really a good place to start. How did you get into weightlifting? How did you find it? How did it all start? So I, I was first, um, it, it happened at school. So a guy came out, he was a talent identification officer and basically gave everyone a chance at doing the clean and jerk. Um, not a lot of technical advice, just this is how you do it. And it was a CrossFit gym. Send it. <laughs> it, was that, it was like, he, it was, he actually came from weightlifting. Like CrossFit wasn't um, was going back thing? then. So it was almost 20 years ago now. And um, I weighed a, a little 35 kilos, um, and I clean and jerk 35 kilos. Um, and that was the first time I'd ever heard about weightlifting, seen a weightlifting bar or touch run. And so um, he was pretty excited uh, when that happened. So, uh, and I was 13 at the time. So it was like, especially like um, unheard of for a female to do a sport like this as well. Mm. And so that's how I first learned about weightlifting. And at the time I uh, did, gymnastics and trampolining so it's a very different sport to what I was normal like normally doing and the the training was a lot different like you know gymnastics and trampolining it's always something different where weightlifting it's kind of the same thing over and over again um but after a little stop while stop selling it stop <laughs> selling it <laughs> but honestly like you know once I started competing I just love the community um especially when I went to my first nationals and I'm like I never look back and you always want that extra kilo, so it's so addictive once you start it. So, you know, 20 years later, here I am, still going. So, yeah. you know, it's just exciting now. So hopefully 
my first Olympics this year and we'll see how that goes if the virus goes yeah, away. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, what an incredible time we, we are in at the moment. Okay, so 13, someone comes past and they say to you, we think you'd be pretty good at this. Yeah. How do we get from, from that point to being now, like preparing to go to the Olympics? You know what, it's been a mass, like really long road. Really long road. We've got plenty of time. So many ups and downs. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, uh, you know, it, it has taken a long time, but it's just, it, it's, it has been really enjoyable and it has gone by pretty quick. Like to think that this year will be my 20 year mark in weightlifting, uh, that's just ridiculous. So, uh, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. So, um, you know, I was just lucky enough to get involved when I was really young. So um, it was something that I was able to grow with as, as the sport grew, as I got stronger. Um, and women in weightlifting have started to get bigger as well, so it's all been really exciting. So you managed to uh, get to the, the top right at the right time then? Yeah, well, it's been really weird. Like, usually, like, as a lifter, like, you, you know, you, you come in, you learn, you get really, like, you start lifting some PBs, and then generally, like, there's a lot of plateaus during that period. Uh, and so from in the 20 years, like, so from the year 2000, my best year was 2015. And then even last year, I, I did the biggest numbers I ever have in training, and so that's 2019. So when you think about how long that's been, it's just crazy. So, um, you know, and I, I, you know, 2000 and even like 13, 12, I kind of thought that I'd sort of hit, hit the best I could, you know, reach as a weightlifter. So to still be able to improve, it was just like mind blowing and it couldn't be happier. Yeah. So what would you contribute that to? So obviously, like, Last year was the biggest numbers you've ever hit. Yeah. Um, what, 18 years into the sport? Like, yeah. what, a, what would you put that down to? Well, I guess um, both of the, those years were pre-Olympic years, so I guess I really had uh, my mind set on trying to get to the Olympics. Um, 2015, I did, like, focus a lot more on weightlifting. It is, it is easier if you can... I mean, if you're able to train full-time and be a proper elite athlete, um, you know, there's heaps of benefits with that, um, even just with recovery and less stress. Uh, but I think, and then last year, I knew I really had to be at the top of my game to even just try to cling on to some sort of position to give myself the opportunity to make these Olympics. So, and because this one was like individual qualification, it just made it, uh, a lot more within my reach as opposed to being number one in Australia um, and, and having to, to maintain that spot over the qualifying period. Like, it's hard to compete every time and be at your best. And so, I mean, for me, like, I can really see that leading into this year. Like, I've just, you know, after the competition that I did in December, the Qatar Cup um, or Doha International, um, I just really struggled to recover and so my weights have declined because I just wasn't able to squat, like even a standing squat, um, body weight squat, I just, I couldn't, it just hurt too much. So um, I think, you know, your body just gets pushed to the limits all the time and uh, with, with this qualification system. And so, you know, as much as this virus is probably, uh, you know, it's a really bad, bad thing that's going on around the world, it's, it's, it, it's good in a way for me because, like, it's giving me a bit of rest time now before Olympics to actually get in a, a proper um, cycle of training and then hopefully Olympics does continue and I, I can get there and actually do some, like, lift at my peak performance. Yeah, well, hopefully it's not four years of rest, right, yeah. <laughs> before we get to the Olympics. But, I mean, like, you know, it's, it's um, the, the psychological side of weightlifting is massive, so... Yeah. Uh, when, when you get given a target to, to reach, to get to somewhere that you really want to get to, um, it does help when you are training. It, you know, it, it helps you maintain focus and maintain that drive um, and passion to, to push as hard as you can and to keep yeah. going. I think that's an important story to tell is that other side where you have periods of time where it hurts to do a, you know, a bodyweight squat. Um, because I think particularly in a time of Instagram and Facebook and, and highlight reels, um, when people are looking up to the top level, you almost think like, how do they do it all the time? Those numbers, every session seems to hit, you know, um, these max efforts and it's like over here hurting, trying to do like my mobility in the corner kind of thing. Yeah, it, I mean, social media these days is really not what it is in real life. Um, and especially, I, I know, 
I can't, I'm not super massive on social media, but uh, if I do post something, generally it is something where I have been successful in training uh, or in a competition. And so it is hard when you see social media and that's all you see. It's always something good and people are going awesome. And then you're sitting there at home or, you know, at training going, oh my God, I, don't know, I just can't do this right now. But I think that's a really important thing. Um, I know, like, for Australian Open, I wasn't in any shape. I uh, mentally as well as physically, and I was just like, I, I didn't want to be there. I had to make weight, uh, so cutting was a massive problem. Uh, my training was a massive problem, and you know, it is hard when you don't want to. You don't want people to see that because mm -hmm. uh, it, it is hard to to show, um, I guess, the vulnerable side of somebody, um, and so. You know, it, it has been hard this year, but I think at the same time, it is important to, to show that you are only human and, um, you know, it, everyone is going to have, like, everyone will have their ups and downs um, in any sport. So um, it's, it's just all a part of the journey. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, we, we've talked a little bit about, about that, about the, I guess, the anxiety and depression and, and how it impacts your training. Like, I know personally it resonates with me so much because I do suffer from a lot of anxiety and depression, um, sometimes daily. Um, and so when I hear a story like yours and being able to overcome that with different strategies and stuff, um, it, it gives me hope. It gives, it gives uh, I know it gives a lot of other people hope hearing, hearing your story as well, but like how, how does that anxiety um, impact your training and impact your eating and cutting and all that type of stuff? And, um, what do you what kind of what do you do about that when when it comes up? Yeah, it, it's absolutely massive. I uh, Really struggle to even because I, I work full-time so generally when I have that do, anxiety so I work in um, Finance for a security company, so I, um, I feel you. <laughs> <It's> depressive <laughs> so, as anything. So, you know, sitting down doing the same thing every day um, But then around two o'clock generally um, it just hits me and I'm just like Real, like falling asleep um, so during like 2017-18 I was finding myself having to have naps under my desk and I was just lucky that my my boss you know I was very open with him and I, he was super su supportive uh, which I'm so grateful for because like yeah I'd have like a half an hour nap just because I couldn't keep my eyes open I couldn't focus or think and so then to drive to training, like so Cougars from my work is about half an hour away and about 45 minutes from home. So it's not, it's not just a short distance to get to. And so sometimes I was falling asleep whilst driving or I'd arrive at the gym and I'd just fall asleep in the car park and Angie's going, didn't I see your car outside? I'm like, yeah, sorry, I fell asleep. And then I woke up and it was like 6.37, so I thought I may as well just go home. Um, and so I was finding myself doing that um, so often during 2017, 18, and um, it was just, yeah, it was just hard to actually just physically get in there. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, even even now, like I still struggle a little bit with anxiety. I mean, that's that was my biggest problem this year. Uh, so once I got, uh, even, even when I was in Doha, so after I'd competed, I'm not, you know, I'm not really sure why, but just had, um, just really bad anxiety and so that just continued when I got home I thought it would get better when I got home but it just continued and so I would usually when I train I generally I, I do try to push myself pretty hard so I would train hard the next maybe like four sessions would really struggle to even get on the bar and so then I'd go see physio and massage and then the next day I'd be out of train again and then it'd be another week until I saw them. So um, this year uh, it hasn't been really good at all. Uh, but the last couple of weeks, um, being able to get back into a better routine again, the anxiety started to go away and uh, recovery starting to happen again. So I know when I was talking to my psychiatrist, he said, you know, your body goes into a a fight or flight mode and so your body is constantly trying to um, s supplement your body in the way that you can um, if you need to like you know run or fight you can do that straight away and so it's constantly working really hard and so when you have that all the time yeah you can't then 
you know, actually put your efforts and energy into something else. Uh, so you get sick a lot. Um, I was getting ton tonsillitis constantly, so I had them removed. Um, but yeah, just constantly sick. Uh, so now, now that's starting to die off. I'm actually, my body's actually able to switch off and start recovering as it should do. So um, hopefully, I'll ho yeah, hopefully over the next few months I'll get back to my best because, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit, I, I want to be able to go to the Olympics and even though I'm not going to be, you know, podium or anything like that, I'd, I'd really love to be able to go there and just do the best lifts that I'm capable of mm. and um, like the PBs that I did in training last year, I haven't put on platform yet, so I'm, I'm really excited to try to You know to they're do in that. the tank just ready to... Yeah, yeah like, yeah. It, you know, to be able to actually lift it and you're just like... You know, so you just know that you're actually cap physically capable of doing it. Um, makes it so much ex more exciting when you actually get on the platform and you know, um, try to try to lift those numbers. So if I can do that as a 55, like if I can hit around you know the 88, 110, I'll be so happy. So and I'd, I'd be happy to hang my shoes up, but I don't think I ever, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I ever could. Like I just you know weightlifting's been a part of my life for so long. I don't know what I'd do if I stopped. So yeah, it's a, it's an interesting conundrum to be in when. Um, I think a lot of people don't understand the pressure that comes with, with being a you know, professional athlete, right? It's not um, going to the gym as a source of stress relief, but somewhat it can be another source of stress as well, right? And um, especially when you're at the level you're at, no doubt there's expectations, you know, that you would put on yourself as, as well as that others tend to have. And yeah, you're kind absolutely. of managing all those different, you know, no wonder your cortisol's up through the roof yeah. and you're getting sick all the time because there is it, a, well, a constant state of stress. it's funny you say that, like, because um, once... Once I sort of, once they brought out the Olympic qualification process, I started to go, oh, you know what, there is a, there's a small possibility that I can reach those marks that I need to. So I actually was so embarrassed with um, my body weight. I got up to about 65 kilos. Um, I was embarrassed with how much I was lifting, weighing so heavy, um, in comparison to what I, I was always like, you know, I always competed at the 53s. So, um, and I mean, Olympic trials, last time around I was I dropped all the way down to 48 so to weigh 65 and to to not be lifting very much it was very hard uh, mentally to walk into a weightlifting gym knowing you know because you know it's not that all eyes are on me or anything like that but uh, that's something that someone with anxiety depression struggles with like no one could care about what you're doing, but, but you, you, you think yeah. that everyone's watching or that everyone cares about what you're doing or is judging you. And I mean, that's not the case at all. I, I mean, especially the club I go to, they're all so great and supportive. Um, but mentally, you just don't think that. So I actually went and trained at a CrossFit club that was um, near my house. And that was, for me personally, it was a better environment because no one knew who I was. I just went in there, did my own thing, and they were all... Um, you know, hand slaps and fist pumps. So it was all like elbows you know. and <laughs> elbows yeah, and elbows shoes and now. Feet now. Um, But I mean, that's just what I needed. And so, literally, like I had to get out of that weightlifting environment because I just felt so much pressure. Um, and that then, you know, really got me to that stage where I was then confident enough to go back to a weightlifting gym and uh, back to getting on top of things, um, trying to make the Olympics and. Um, yeah, it, it makes a massive difference. Yeah, I think the it, it's important to have fun, right? Absolutely. And I think that um, when you are aiming so high that, it, you know, it does become a, it, this isn't fun and, and going in every day and squatting heavy and, and beating yourself up and mm. especially in a sport like weightlifting where, you know, your weight is so important and, and it is based on, on weight class that um, mm. it's just more and more pressure too, right? It's not like you can go into a CrossFit comp and just go in, you know, super well fed and it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, it really is like as big, arguably as big a part of the sport as what you do on the platform. Mm. Right? And I know I, I, every competition I go into, I'm more nervous about what I weigh than what I lift. So even like today, like, you know, it was, it was just for fun, but it's like, oh my God, I don't want to get on those scales. Like, you know, it's, it's definitely more daunting for me than lifting and it's something that I've you know I've got a really bad relationship with food now because of this so you know I yeah for me I definitely agree with you yeah yeah and that's unfortunately like that's something that we we see a lot um and we see it a lot not just in in weightlifters but across the population in general mm. um and I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole but um yeah, it's, it's something that is pretty systemic 
across all ages. It doesn't discriminate, you know, genders at all. I think it's often a lot of times being more associated that, um, you know, women and, and young women are more concerned about their, their scale weight. But, but definitely what we're seeing is it's transcending across mm. everyone. And I suppose especially with the increase of social media as well, like, yeah. you know, it's photos and videos, like especially like Instagram, Snapchat, it's all just pictures so yeah and like you said it's the highlight reel right it's not what you yeah. what's happening every single day it's it's what it's their best side it's their best angle it's their best post and yeah sometimes it's not catch even, the lighting just right exactly you know. yeah, sometimes shopping. it's not even yeah. like the photo doesn't actually resemble what was happening in that moment but they write the caption all positive and they're, they're all positive in the caption but then in reality it wasn't quite that way or yeah. um, trying to come across a, a certain way that, that you're not actually living. Well how many people do you know have done like one bodybuilding show and then like that's their profile picture for like the rest <laughs> of their lives right? Um, it's a similar sort of thing and, and that's a whole nother conversation when you start literally entering a sport which is judging you on your aesthetic it, it just becomes a, a completely different game but um, I think it's you know super grateful for to, to have this chat and, and to talk about these topics because like we said it, it's not something that gets a lot of um you know light at all um and if you think of the sport doesn't get a whole lot of coverage this side of the sport gets even even less of that right and i think that rather than trying to hide this side of the sport from people to make the sport look more appealing i think that having people being courageous enough to tell that you know and being able to relate with probably everyone else in the room that's kind of had those thoughts from time to time actually makes the community a lot more appealing and a lot stronger right and like you so you were saying in the warm-up room um after after your first cleaning joke i think how nervous you were um and this is this wasn't even a sanctioned competition this was just <laughs> something we put on is, is are those nerves there for every competition like how do you battle those yeah. nerves and um yeah, I guess, what, what do you do around that? I think, I mean, I think for this comp, like, you know, I, I know that I hadn't been training the greatest, but um, to be able to, I guess, like, um, to given the be, be given the opportunity to, sh to showcase what I can do, I wanted to do a good performance, and it was just the pressure I put on myself for this event. Um, I mean, in training, I, I've done 88, 110. In competition, my best are 85. Uh, 106 so um, the numbers I've been hitting especially in the snatch aren't, aren't as great as I'm hoping for um, especially you know this close to such a big event um, so in like when I'm at home the small comps that I do for fun um, I generally do much better in because um, I'm not I'm not trying to get there's a, there's a, a lesson there right or, <laughs> yeah like you know you don't have any pressures or um, like I don't, I don't worry about how I do perform, so it's um, a lot less pressure. Uh, yeah, here it was just because I really wanted to put on a good show. Um, but yeah, definitely like big internationals, um, you always want to put yourself in the in the best position to get the best placing. Mm -hmm. And uh, but for some reason, those ones aren't as bad either. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but no, I, I usually have a little bit of um, nerves, and I think that's a probably a good thing. Yeah. Um, because it does get me really excited and I do like to scream a bit when I get nervous so uh, that does come out and it just helps me calm down a little bit. Uh, so Hopefully Akka's got some of that in the, uh, <laughs> the warm-up area at the <laughs> Open, did he? No, no. Yeah, we weren't allowed in the warm-up oh, area okay. unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, but um, but yeah, no, it was, it, was, it was so cool anyway, it was so cool at the Open to watch that. And, and watch your lift and, and all the guys there to watch lift, yeah. Yeah, I, and I think that's kind of the other side of the coin too, is we're not saying that, you know, you ever, we, don't, we wouldn't want you to go into anything completely nerve-free either, right? Because you're nervous because you care, yeah. right? Yeah, you um, want to Yeah, and if you, if you weren't so fast, it'd be like, well, what are we really doing here then? Yeah. Right, if you don't care at all. And it's almost like, yeah, if you do feel like that, it may be the opposite where you just, you don't really care what you're going to lift and you don't really want to be there, so... Um, yeah, sometimes it's, I find it, I definitely find it beneficial. Yeah. I've definitely been in those shoes. The end of last year, I did a couple competitions and I just kind of got to the point where I was like, I just don't want to be here. Yeah. Like, I just like got to the warm up room. I had a nap beforehand and I was uh, just, I was just like, I just don't want to be here. Like, yeah. can I just pull out now? I had a shitter of a day in the snatch and then tried to pull it together in the cleaning jokes. And it wasn't a bad day, but it was just not, not ideal. Yeah. Um, but, Obviously, you've had a lot of highlights in your career as well. Um, one of them being the um, only female in Australian history to clean a joke double body weight. Um, do you want to talk us through that and kind of what, 
what led into that and um, and how it how it went down. Yeah, that was a lot of yelling in the. <laughs> <laughs> that one. That was a little bit funny. Um, I had to cut weight a little bit for that one too. So um, we weren't sure how it's going to feel and. Generally, when I do cut a bit of weight, I get really dizzy in the clear and jerks. And Angie, um, we should chat after the workout. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, my coach Angie, she's, um, I mean, it was national championship, so um, the main goal was to um, secure the medal first. And uh, so once we sort of did that, it was kind of like, well, you know, what do we do now? And she was happy just to. I think she said maybe 104 or something like that. But I was just like. Nah, don't worry, Angie, just send it, like, throw the 106 on. And she, you know, because my, my first and second list didn't look great. Um, but I've been trying, I was trying to hit that weight since the Arnold's, which was at the beginning of the year. And I'd, I'd done it in training separately. Uh, actually, I cleaned 109, um, but I jerked 106. So I knew I was capable of doing the numbers, but I hadn't put it together in training. Um, and then... On the comp stage, I usually compete better, so I, you know, we we went for it quite a few times, and then, so I was like, by that stage, I was like, you know what, who cares? Just put it on and see how it goes, and it just it happened to be um, probably one of my best lifts of all time. Um, on like the Instagram, <laughs> put that one up on the gram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and so it was kind of exciting because I just wasn't expecting it, but ended up pulling through somehow. Like I literally felt like my knee was on the floor in the jerk. Because uh, I, I felt like it just pushed me down so low, like just below your normal, you know, catch position. So, um, but oh yeah, it was just very exciting to sort of finally hit it. And it was kind of the same as like just here, you know, putting too much pressure on myself that it was, you know, such a big ordeal um, in my mind that it, yeah, all the other times that I went for it was just such a struggle. Uh, so it was a time that I didn't care so much <laughs> that I was like, yeah, I just put it on that I ended up pulling through. But again, so. it comes down to the pressure, right? Like yeah. you don't have that pressure on you. You can enjoy it a little bit more and you just go out and hit it. Yeah. And I mean, I know it was a little bit like that with Maria's lift today. She's sitting in the audience saying, hi, Maria. <laughs> um, she came out and crushed an 85 cleaning joke, which she hasn't done before. There and, you go. So and, Kat's been told. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and yeah, just no pressure. There was no pressure in this competition. We didn't even plan to go heavy, and um, and we ended up doing it. And, and she had a great day. And, mm. and it just comes down to just enjoying the moment and exactly. and just feeling what you feel and, and go out there and crush it. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, with a it's hard as well with a, a heavy competing schedule too, right? Because um, obviously, if you compete infrequently and it's something to look forward to and, and build up into and mm. um, peak four again it's almost like all right I'm ready to show like what I've been able to do and what I've built for the last couple of months or whatever else but yeah. um, when you're competing quite frequently it is that adrenaline yes. spike and then dump and and um, I know with a lot of our clients especially when it's their first comp you know they think they're going to go back to training on Monday after maxing out on the Sunday. Yeah. So you just need to like <laughs> understand that. Like, yeah. yeah. Like if, if we if we have to wait, cut, then max out, then recover. A competition is not the you know forty seconds or forty five seconds you're on the platform. It's it's that two week that one oh, week on yeah. the side of it, right? Mm. Um, so yeah, if you're doing that every four weeks, it's it's been really bad this <laughs> this Olympic period. I I mean I started my my competitions quite late as well, so. Um, by the time I got into shape, it was the very end of the like very end of period one, um, and that was my my first Olympic qualifier, uh, and so I've kind of done well, been trying to squish my six competitions into twelve months as opposed to the eighteen months. So, um, I mean, it's been crazy, but at the same time, like for me personally, the competitions are massive motivations, and like tra any sort of like training camps, like coming here for instance, it's just. Um, huge for my motivation it just I, I love weightlifting so much that it um, gets me excited to get back into the gym in the following week so um, as, as tough it, as tough ugh, tough as it has been it's been so enjoyable at the same time yeah. Um, but yeah it's definitely taken its toll on the body but um, hopefully it'll be all worth it in the end yeah it's funny what you said before as well where you just mentioned you, you're always after that that next kilo and that yeah. next kilo <laughs> Um, and I guess there's an important part of the conversation too, right, that becomes um, how much we place on, you know, not necessarily the importance of meeting the goal, but um, whether it's a goal weight or a goal total, that once you've achieved it, 
it's not necessarily going to be this light shining moment where like you feel like everything's fulfilled and like all the pressure's off, right? It's like, okay, I made weight. Now I've got to go and compete, right? Oh, okay, now I've PR'd. Well, now I've done it once. Now I want more and I want more and I want more, yeah. right? Um, yeah, it's an interesting career path. <laughs> <laughs> Chosen for sure. And I think like I was, I was actually going to put up a post soon because um, I actually have listed down every competition I've ever competed in, um, my body weight, the, the lifts I've done, which were misses and which were successful. And um, just to show that it is, it's such a long journey and you do really go through those moments where you know, your, your weights will um, plateau and if not plateau, even go down, like you know, when you get injured, when you, um, you know, there's so many external factors that can affect that. But just to show everyone that you know, this hasn't been like an overnight um, accomplishment and you know don't get me wrong like there are some incredible lifters like um, I mean one of one of the someone who does come to mind like mind you they they do have a crossfitting background but like Riley Porter like you when say Riley. yeah like, you know when um, they I mean they are exceptions like there there are some people who are just naturally gifted to the sport and you know they they're other um, you know the other things that they do in life do um, complement weightlifting and so especially you know crossfitters like you know Riley, Tia Claire like they can come in um, not not have a big background in weightlifting but really do well and so I remember the first time I watched Riley compete um, in his first comp he qualified for an Australian team and his second comp was on the Australian team so I you know some people you know do have that uh, it's, uh, it's not I wouldn't call it luck um, they, they do work hard they do um, train a lot to get to where they are but you know that's the f it's not like that for everyone yeah um, but so like I guess from when you look at when you compare like myself in comparison to Riley like um, I guess that's where you see the differences like you know just to see mine has just it's been a really long journey but just so I like, just to give people um, I guess that that look in on it's not, you know, you can't always just come in and compete and be the best in Australia or the Oceania region. Um, it, it does take hard work. It does take a long time. And, um, but, you know, if it's something that you want and you have goals, um, give yourself the opportunity first. Yeah. And then, you know, hopefully well, you get there. I'm not even the best weightlifter in our house. So <laughs> I completely understand that. Yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Um, when you tell me a little bit about kind of the early days weightlifting, um, you you've been in the sport now for twenty years. At what stage was it? Was it from right from the beginning where where they were like, "This is what you're gonna do now," or was it like, "Let's weightlift for the next couple of months, see how you feel, see if you enjoy it"? Um, was it something that you feel like you had to grow into and learn to love, or was it from the first time you picked up that barbell that you're like, "Yeah, this is for me." I definitely grew to love it. Uh, I, I mean, with my background, it's gymnastics and like weightlifting are completely different. And so um, I was, I loved the the different challenges that gymnastics gave you. However, when I, whenever I'd compete, I just, I would just always screw up my routine, um, and it happened all the time. Like when I went to nationals for trampolining, there was not one time I competed where I actually got because you, you do two routines in trampolining and I would nail one but I'd stuff up completely the other and that's just how my nationals always went and uh, so then when I started doing weightlifting they they got us into like a, a three-month scholarship to begin with so a lot of um, the lifters in Queensland that's kind of how they get into it um, and after that scholarship finished I was like you know what weightlifting it's not really for me it's you know what what is this like barbell stuff like how about can I, I just I was I just wanted to put more weights on like <laughs> give me more and my coach was like you know it's just about technique right now like I'm like man this is boring What's that? What's <laughs> <technique>? <laughs> yeah. and so um I then I did take um I did stop after my three-month scholarship my brother continued um and no doubt he's the reason why I'm still here so he continued uh you wanted nationals. to be the best one in your house. Oh, it wasn't even, yeah, basically, yeah. you know. Um, but he then went to his first international competition, and that's where I got so jealous. Uh, he went to, um, where was it, Kiribati, And I was just like, 
what is what mm -hmm. like he gets to travel overseas um and that's kind of when I and, and the coach said to me look if you just trained you could have been there too like um so we made a deal he said if you give me three months I think it was three months um you need to compete at the states then you need to keep training and if every session you complete you'll get a Fredo frog and then <laughs> if you do that's that, such a weight <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, if you do that for the three so months, awesome. you can go to Sydney. And I was like, yeah, I want to go to Sydney. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Fredo Pogs, yeah. So um, I did that. I went to my first national championships in 2002. So back then it was under 16, under 18. And uh, just like meeting everyone, I, I made really good friends from the different states and just within the state as well. Like so much bonding. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what initially really got me hooked um, and the competition side of it. Like I, I really love competing and um, just like being around people who end up having the same interest. But the difference between this and trampolining and gymnastics was when I was on the platform, I, I just, I was able to be in my own space and I always, I, 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 I it felt right. I, and I did well every time. And so for me, it was just like, look, I think, I think I do love this sport so you know I stop holding back and just compete and uh, so that's kind of yeah where it all started but I mean and mind you like over those years as well I've had uh, um, not not a lot of injuries especially when you compare it to other sports so uh, major injuries have it's probably been um, three of them so I have, I've had to take time off for those one of those I had to get an operation for so uh, that's a, like a labral tear in my left hip and so that's quite a common um, injury for weightlifters, like getting into the deep squat position. Don't know anything about that either. <laughs> it's power or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you know, it's just, it goes along with any sport. But I mean, I think at the end of the day, weightlifting is probably one of the safest sports you can do. So um, I was just, yeah, really lucky to, I guess, fall into it and for my brother to keep competing and make me jealous enough to actually want want to keep going my lifting and so I'm absolutely blessed like I've had um, an, a pretty incredible career so far uh, and like I, I yeah I mean I've got regrets of course like I wish that I um, tried as hard as I could all the way from the start like I really sort of only started pushing once I finished high school uh, and um, that was like leading into my first Commonwealth Games, so I was uh, 18 at the time. And so I just wish that I sort of pushed a bit harder when I was younger. I, um, yeah, I feel like there was a bit of time wasted, so. Um, but yeah, at least I sort of learned that lesson and I think that's really hard for a lot of people. Like it's, it's easy to just uh, like try to learn from others, but you, sometimes you just have to, yeah. <laughs> to make your own mistakes to grow from them, so. Um, yeah, but that's, yeah. Is, what got me hooked. Is your brother still competing? No. So um, he, he also had a gymnastics and trampolining background. I just followed and copied everything he did. So that was baseball and diving and just everything. So uh, when he did trampolining, he actually came off one of the apparatuses and got his foot stuck between two crash mats and um, broke his ankle. So then to come to weightlifting, like it was recovered and everything, but... Um, just to, and he had wrist problems as well. So just getting into those deep squats and um, just different p positions made it really difficult. So um, he, he, he represented Australia quite a number of times. So um, he's had a really good career in weightlifting as well. Um, but yeah, he, um, he's tried to come back a couple of times and uh, hurt his back, pinched nerve, I think, a couple of times. Um, but, uh, yeah, like, I, I think, yeah, definitely without him, I wouldn't be here, so yeah. it's good. Nice. <laughs> so in terms, like, so you've obviously been in the sport for, for a long time, for 20 years. That's a long time to be on a, on a training program. And we were talking on Thursday night how you said, I asked, what are you doing? What's on the program today? And like, oh, <laughs> oh, no. I just write my own daily. And I was like, what? How do you write your own daily yeah. and, and be at this level? But you said you've tried so many other training programs and they yeah. all kind of do the same thing. What have you tried and what has been good for you and what hasn't and, yeah. um, and kind of when in the cycle have you been uh, mm. trying that? Uh, so, I mean, uh, over the 20 years I've had, um, uh, it's, it's 
maybe around six or seven coaches over that period. Um, definitely most of it's been with Angela. Uh, but I've tried, like with the different coaches, we've tried, um, I guess you can c kind of go down to styles. Like one, one is a program where you do lots of different styles of exercises. Um, and you know, there's so many that you can choose from. Uh, and then the complete opposite you know, um, side of that is when you just basically do um, snatch, clean and jerk squat. And so I've done both uh, sides of that and I did well off both of them. So I kind of worked out that um, as long as I train hard, I can still do well and improve. So I know that uh, like Bulgarian style program is not, not really benefit, like not easy for people, especially within Australia who have lives outside of training as well. But um, when I did that style of program, I, I was actually in New Zealand just for, um, I was there for about three months, I think, and um, trained with Richie Patterson uh, and his coach, um, Ari, who was, he, he's from Finland. And so he sort of brought that training style program to New Zealand. And um, I was at, when I did that, it was 2007, I was ready to quit, um, hang up my boots. So I just um, had my, I came, came back from my hip operation um, and was just really struggling to find that motivation again. And I said to him that, you know, I'm just, uh, I don't know if I can come back from this. It's so hard to start from square one again. And um, he said, oh, you know, just come to New Zealand. You can stay at my house for free. You can just train for free and just like pay for anything extra that you need. And um, I took him up on the offer and trying that program, I got back into it again. And I, you know, it was, I, I didn't do anything else, mind you. So we trained in the morning and in the afternoon and we just did, yeah, literally snatch, clean and jerk and squat. No pulls, I love that. Um, <laughs> and, but yeah, it worked for me. So. Um, I know that now, like, yeah, as long as I'm doing something um, that's beneficial, I, I can still do well. And so the main thing I do now, and so it was, it's only been since the beginning of last year, and it was because I felt really bad because I was really struggling to get back into training. Um, I felt like I was just wasting Angie's time um, just because I wasn't able to follow the program properly. Um, do the, the three or four exercises a day. And so I just, I said to her, like, look, I'm just, I'm just wasting your time right now. Like, don't worry about a program for me. And um, I'll, I'll just, you know, do what I can at the time because I was just really struggling sometimes, like overhead or my knees were sore, my back was sore. So each time I'd go in, I'd just play with the bar, see how I feel. And um, like, for instance, like I went through a period where I had really sore shoulders, so if that happened um, during a session, then I'd just cut out overhead movements and work around it. So it ended up being really helpful that way, um, especially because um, I'm, like, I'm, I'm 33 this year, so just the recovery side of So that's getting a bit harder. Yeah. At 25, Josh wouldn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> so like, you know, it, it does start to get harder. So, um, and I mean, it, it just happened to work. So Angie was like, you know what, it's working. Um, and she said to be like the first cycle that we did, she actually thought that I was following her program. So <laughs> we had, she's like, look, I thought you were following the program anyway. So we we're just like, you know what, this is working. Let's just keep doing it. Um, if we do see issues, then we'll have to, um, you know, obviously make a change, but um, it was just working. So um, yeah, I've just really had to play it by ear. Um, so is she just there for like the, I guess the technical support and the um, and the mental support and obviously on comp day and stuff like that. Is that kind of her main role as a coach now? Um, she, well, I mean, she's, she's kind of like my second mum. I was going to um, say she's the adult that yeah. <laughs> chaperone, chaperones so, you to competition. Yeah, like, don't get me wrong. Like, if, if there's something that I need to change or that I need to fix, she will definitely let me know. Um, the, the biggest thing that she has been for me over the last couple of years is just, um, just like the... Sh the, sh like, um, the shoulder I need to lean on. Mm -hmm. And there's been times, like I remember when I went to the Pacific Games last year, I just, it was just before I started, I opened on the clean and jerk, I just broke down. So she, she's she been there through um, all my trials and so she kind of knew what to expect. So um, I almost feel like she's more than a coach. So um, what she does for me is more than what I could ask from any, from any coach. And um, I literally just broke down into tears. She just hugged me and held me up. And then she's just like, 
you got a job, let's get it done. You got to go out there and clean yeah. double body weight. <laughs> well, it, that was that was probably one of the closest competitions I've had. There were there were three of us. Oh, actually, no, there was, there was three of us in the Oceania region all pushing for medals. And then on top of that, there were two more um, that were competing in the Commonwealth Championships. So uh, for me, the main thing was to win the Pacific Games. So um, that's what all we aimed for. So I did come third in the Commonwealth. Um, but for Olympic qualification, the Oceanias was uh, the main thing to win. So, um, but yeah, like she, she just knows exactly what I need to do. Um, she kind of knows... Um, my mindset and how I lift and my technique that um, we don't need to communicate a lot anymore. She'll just, she'll, you know, sometimes to my disappointment, but like sometimes she'll be like, you know, let's just drop down that start weight or uh, let's just go for this. Like don't, you know, she just has to get me not to push it so much, but um, she, she can see where I'm at when I'm lifting. So um, yeah, it makes a big big difference coaches and what is that routine that you go through pre-comp um every lifter has something a little bit different and um left shoe I, left shoe first yeah exactly <laughs> i mean my socks have to be in line i wear the same socks like what is your do you have any of those like quirks or do you have a routine a week out or what what is your what is your go uh i i used to when i was younger for like odd socks or yeah but nowadays it's just you know I can just get out there and uh, probably uh, actually I probably do have something I just lather myself in deep heat. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that's that's, that's my warm up routine. <laughs> yeah, I like just put all the deep heat on I can. Um, but yeah, <laughs> now nowadays it's I, I don't I try not to worry. I've got too much stuff to be anxious about, let alone um, trying to keep on to any um, little bad habits or good habits that you want to get into. But even like. Um, I just found that as I compete, it's just best to do whatever my body feels, and that's how I started screaming. Like I don't know, I just let it out. Yeah. yeah, like yeah. I, I originally tried hiding it, uh, so I'd like sneak out behind the curtain or something, and and then there was this one competition. I went out onto the floor, and I thought I was quiet. It was at like the Brisbane, uh, the one at Chan Lights, like um, a big. Yeah. Time. Anyway, so I thought I was quiet as, and I'm, because <clears throat> <laughs> I really wanted to scream, but I didn't. And then my brother was just like, "Why do you sound like a dog?" <laughs> like, I'm like, so I listened to the video, and you could hear it all, and I was so embarrassed. So I'm just like, you know what? I'm just gonna scream. Just stop caring about what anyone else thinks, and <laughs> so I just started screaming now. So I don't even scream like at a certain point, or I I don't. It, I just, if I feel like I need to, I just do it. And that's what I tell other, other lifters. Like, if you feel like stomping your feet, stomp it, clapping your hands, like, whatever your body feels like it needs to do, just do it. Yeah. Um, don't care about what anyone else thinks because at the end of the day, they probably don't care. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and you're going to be the one on the podium anyway, so exactly, that's, that's, and that, that's where that's going to matter. No, like, I really find screaming makes a difference for me now. So, like... Yeah, I just stopped caring what other people thought. I think that's the hardest part about weightlifting is the silence when you yeah. like walk up to the platform. Like when you're maxing clean and jerk in a CrossFit comp, there's 10 other people around you, barbells are dropping and you're like, oh good, no one's watching. <laughs> right? yeah. But when you're at a weightlifting comp and it's dead silence and you can hear like your feet on the platform, like walking <laughs> up to the bone, you're like, just quickly lift this so I can get back off. Um, I reckon that's probably one of the hardest it's parts. It's definitely of the, the most intimidating bit for new lifters to get in, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Like, I, I know I've talked to so many new lifters and they're like, can we have the music going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> like a full minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In and out. 10, 15 seconds. That's it. Um, yeah. I, I, and I think, that's, I think that's true of anything. Like, um, you know, especially when you do, you, you are trying to regulate that shot of adrenaline too in your system as well right and i think that if you don't do that and you start to get a bit jittery especially in something like a snatch which is so so technical and mm. and the heavier it gets the more precise it needs to be and yeah. if you're feeling a little bit pent up or tense in, in the wrong spots then it's for you especially i mean for me it's not the potential between like first and and, and second but um yeah especially i think it's you should be comfortable when you mm. get out there that's definitely yeah something that I encourage anyone to do. Like just there's just a generation of female lifters now yelling for like every lift. <laughs> well, I mean, listening. you know, honestly, like back um, the guys were fine, but back 
when I was younger, like for the girls to make a noise, it was just so unladylike and like, you know, oh, they grunt, like, oh, sound like a man, like, there's just so many negative thoughts and um, now that it's really grown and I just got to a point now where I just, I don't care, like, I'm, I, you know. Too old to care. But, yeah. <laughs> You're 30, I don't care anymore. Uh, once again, too, too many more, like, bigger things to worry about than um, screaming on platforms, so, um, but, you know, and, like, you know, it is, I think it is quite difficult for women, especially, you know, there, there's lots of women who compete now who have had children and, I mean, you know, uh, lose that pelvic floor muscle strength and, you know, stuff like that does become difficult and embarrassing, but um, at the end of the day, that you know, it's everyone. It's, I mean, guys might fart on platform, that's probably not that bad anyway, but, uh, like, there are things that, you know, can happen that are embarrassing, but at the end of the day, it's, it's all women will have that problem. So, yeah. And like um, you said earlier, it's about um, potentially being vulnerable enough to be able to say, hey, this is going to happen or this might happen or this happened and, and be okay with it and not really worry too much about what people were saying and just be yeah. comfortable within yourself. And I think that's something that um, I absolutely love about like Alyssa Ritchie. Uh, mm. She just, it's just like, man, like, I'm a woman, this happens, I get over it, like, you know, I'm not going to stop competing because of it, and I just love that. I love that side of it. And a little pee on the platform never hurt anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned before, you know, the, the possibility or, or maybe flirting with that idea of, of after the Olympics potentially hanging up the weightlifting shoes. Is that something you've seriously thought about? Can you actually see yourself... You know, for something that's been such a big part of your life for so long, yeah. I guess that's got to be um, another daunting part of it too, is like, if you almost becomes part of your identity, right? Yeah. Is it and this weightlifter? I or? mean, it's definitely something difficult, um, especially... I mean, most people say, you know, you want to end it on a good note, um, and it's hard not to end it on one of those big competitions like Olympic Commonwealth Games. Um, but... Like I and I, I have thought about it. Um, I personally have have not had the the best Commonwealth Games that I like. My first Commonwealth Games I got a bronze medal. So the two following that, the the second one, I then tore my ligament um, in my second last clean and jerk warm up. So I couldn't lock my elbows out uh, when I got on the platform. Uh, so then ended up um, basically bombing out. I tried I tried to lift. I just um, yeah, the, the injury, I didn't know how bad it was or the extent of it, but it was, it was very painful, so I just uh, couldn't lock it out. Um, and then the last Commonwealth Games I went to, I went up a weight class, so obviously like the, the level of lifting was a bit higher than what I was um, capable of doing. Uh, so I, I, I know that I am capable of getting back on that podium, and so that's probably the biggest thing that is really holding me... Um, in. I just want, yeah, like I, I, I do really want to go to the next Commonwealth Games. I feel like I haven't um, reached my, my best potential in a Commonwealth Games. And um, like looking at the Gold Coast Com Games, um, I would have medaled based on what my best lifts were as a, as a 53. But yeah, at the end of the day, you can't have, you can't always lift well in every competition. Mm -hmm. And um, I understand that, but it's still keeps that want. So um, I'd, I'd like to go for Birmingham, but um, I know that I'll be 35 then and it's pushing towards the end of like a, an elite career for a female lifter. Um, especially, you know, I don't train full time. Um, so it's, I'm gonna, I'll probably try. <laughs> I'll keep trying. I, I don't know if um, I'll ever stop being involved in weightlifting, even when I do stop, like whether I, um, just head down the technical official side or whether I start coaching. I mean, I, I'd love to start coaching, but I know how much time it takes and how much, um, and like in Queensland, it's still volunteer work. And personally, I wouldn't want to change it because, you know, I've been lucky enough to have a volunteer coach all my lifting career, so I'd only ever want to give back. Um, so I, I'd really love to start coaching eventually, but um, yeah, at the moment, I'm, you know, it's too hard to do both, but and I, I'm still um, trying to lift. Uh, whether I end up being a 90-year-old masters lifter, I'm not sure. <laughs> it might, in my head that way, but um, I mean, yeah, it's always nice to end on a high note. So um, 
I mean, Olympics is the pinnacle, but Commonwealth Games is somewhere that we can medal. So uh, for me, Commonwealth Games actually is, um, I mean, Olympics is like to be an Olympian is just um, something not many people get the opportunity to, to do. Um, and so, I mean, right now that's my main focus, but um, to try to win a Commonwealth Games gold, I think that would like to hear that national anthem standing on the podium at such a major event mm -hmm. would just be the pinnacle. I think it actually adds to just how incredible your accomplishments are when you say, we're still not a full-time athlete too, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think like granted that there are athletes out there like Tia Tumi who are kind of flicking back and forth between two sports at the highest level, um, but it's also, she's, she's earning enough to, to do it as, yeah. a, as a professional and, um, you know, definitely being, a, the more I do this and the more I spend time with guys like um, Chris and, and Josh and, and meat lifters like yourself, the more I'm, you know, hopeful that the more the macros podcast, the weightlifting platform and, and those type of outlets um, start to draw more attention and, and get rid of some of that obscurity that, that comes with the sport. Um, because I think with that, once you start to get more light and, and get a little bit of a bigger community, it starts mm -hmm. to come the sponsorships and, and the support for local comps and grassroots and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, which I know is kind of why, you know, when, when what happens with stuff like today is, is kind of doubly a kick in the guts, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, I think such an incredible story and, and to be able to do with you know, what you've done with part, almost part time, right? Like it's kind of just yeah. like, um, you know, imagine as well, like. And don't get me wrong, like, it also creates a lot of like, uh, to, when, when I do compete internationally, um, I mean, a lot of coaches don't understand that you, like your whole life isn't just about the sport and that's not all you do. Um, and so I, I honestly, I've had comments from coaches like, you know, making me feel like I'm not good enough. Um, but at the end of the day, I just need to, I, I just try to remind myself that, I mean, at the, their lifters train full time, mm -hmm. I don't. And just because I'm not beating your lifter doesn't mean that I'm not just as good. Um, I just don't have the luxury of being able to eat, sleep, train. Well, like we um, said, you're arguably better, right? Yeah. Because you're at the same level with like you're with like, half the support. And yeah. And I mean, I mean, it is hard to like go to like uh, like a world championships and you're competing in the B or C group. But um, I think that's something that it just brings you back to you know reality. Like it's okay, you you know you're a clean athlete number mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. and you don't train full time, but you're still here. And I think that's um, like really exciting personally um, and you know and I, I think that's the hard thing about Olympics like to like to train so hard for something knowing that you're probably gonna come last but at the end of the day like I made it um, and these quite like most likely like 99% every other lifter that I'm contending against trains full-time minimum like whether or not they have extra supplements I don't know you know and that's obviously <laughs> innocent until proven guilty but at the end of the day like you know I I know I'm a clean athlete and I'm doing the best that I can so what what can you say and um, I mean and the other thing uh, what was I gonna say um, I mean that really exciting thing uh, for Australian weightlifting is now with um, Eileen coming over from Fiji she's um, really turning a lot of heads and uh, now that she's a citizen, she's able to represent Australia, um, you'll be able to, uh, you, you can see that she's going through a lot more competitions than what Australia is allowing athletes to try to qualify for. And this is specifically for that reason, to, to try to get the support that Australian weightlifting really needs for their top athletes to be able to um, work less, train more, and hopefully get the results that we have the potential of getting, but uh, we just don't have the support that we need right now to be able to um, supplement our financial life, like, like financially um, in this day and age to, to be able to just train. How much of that comes from the top in terms of AWF and things like that and, and kind of their um, ability or, or desire to, to grow and grow and grow? Do you, like, Sometimes with, with some weightlifting clubs, you, it's almost they pride themselves in the fact that 
they do have such a, a close community. Um, is that something that either of you like can speak of, want to speak of, don't want to touch with the temple pole? Like, oh, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, though? Like, I, like, I don't know. Um, talking to a lot of people through the weightlifting platform recently, um, definitely been able to um, talk to guys like Sam Coffer and um, Ian Moyer and, and those type of people We're at the top. And um, it's fantastic to see what they are doing to try and supplement the athletes that we have now. And we definitely have lacked that in the, in the past. Um, athletes are starting to be paid now. It's not much, but it is, it is something. Um, and there are definitely ways where the sport could be grown uh, more and um, allowed to um, I guess branch out into different commercial um, avenues to try and assist athletes to, to become professional but um, at the same time you've got to have those people in the positions to be able to see that and, and to be able to act on that and and, it, and even at those top levels um, like the board is all um, voluntary work so mm -hmm. again you can't expect all these volunteers at the top level to be able to just put all their time and effort into it just the same as these part-time athletes as well they have to work they have to maintain a living and stuff so it does make it very tricky when everything in the sport in Australia is volunteer based um, because no one's really getting paid to put the work in to be able to funnel it down um, so it is tricky but I believe that they are in the, working in the right direction. Um, I like where, where it's going and, and hopefully it can continue going in that direction. Mm. Yeah, agree. Yeah, no, I know, I do agree. Like, um, I mean, I have seen the sport have its ups and downs and just feeling like, you know, at certain times where it's like, you know, do they, do they actually care about the athletes? And instead of putting the money into their own pocket, like, are they actually gonna, um, like, for instance, like, a medal medals at an event like at you know at one point they're like two dollars a medal and it's like how they actually put some like it doesn't it. well just just like have something that people actually want to try to do well and and achieve like not not end up walking away with this tacky little Ribbon. medal that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, that's, but that's the almost thing. what it felt like um and then so um like i really feel like it is yeah taking taking that turn um back to actually the, the, the passion behind the sport and, and not worrying so much about putting money in their own pocket and actually trying to um, help get the resources to support the athletes and um, they are increasing the standards but they're hoping that that is going to increase people's, like the you know, athletes around Australia to, to train harder mm -hmm. and to, to really strive for, um, to achieve the, the harder standard um, so it's not it's not meant to deter people or scare people away. It's trying to increase the level of um, the like the level of all the athletes around Australia, hoping so when we do get to the international level, we are we do become competitive. Yeah. Um, and so I think yeah, right now it's it's cool. Eileen's really leading the way, um, and we're going to see that I think over the next eight years or so. It's it's definitely not going to happen overnight. Um, but and I'll, I'll be. I'll be long gone before we, I see We might any... be leading the charge on the other, <laughs> on the other side of the platform, like, huh? Yeah, exactly. Like, that's yeah. something that I, you know, I, I definitely, like, you know, once, once I'm done, I'm, I'll be giving back to the sport um, with passion, not with trying to put the money in my pocket. And, mm. and that's what we need right now. Like, we need to get that. It needs to take off before we can see the, um, what's the word, like, the, uh, the, the return. return. Yeah. And I think the big thing is uh, uh, the some of the people at the top allowing it to take off and not have not trying to hold on to all that control yourself mm -hmm. um, and allowing clubs um, to be able to do their own thing and, and stuff like that like today um, like we were meant to be giving away two thousand dollars prize money and I mean I know the nationals only give away five hundred dollars to the best male and best female lifter um, and next year we're planning to give away ten thousand dollars worth of prize money um, just from a weekend competition like ours. And, and start hopefully, training. yeah, that's it. <laughs> Might have to start uh, hitting full full <laughs> depth. <laughs> but if we if we can put up two thousand dollars of prize money for or three thousand dollars of prize money for a first place finish at a competition, I mean, I, 
I hope that's a start for, for competitions to be able to be able to look at that and say, hey, we could potentially do that too and, and invite lifters from all across New Zealand and Australia yeah. um, to be able to compete for, for mm. that. And that's huge moti motivation, especially like when you think about you know, what it costs for an athlete to come from interstate. Right. Exactly. If they have the possibility of winning that prize money, they'll, they'll get their money back. And some. And some, and hopefully, yeah, right? Because, yeah, because yeah, it's, I mean, even when you look at something like Nationals, right? Like, $500 is like, okay, well, there's the, the ticket there. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like but not the nice. accommodation. And yeah, it's kind of like, okay, well, I'll probably be here anyway because it's Nationals and stuff like that. But it's, um, and to think that's only like one, one person, right? For, for overall. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it kind of is that double edged sword where it's like, it won't happen until it takes off, but it's equally not going to take off until it starts to happen. So, yeah. at, at which and point? And like, it's we... crazy what you, you, as a lifter, what you can be capable of if you want it that much. Yeah. Like, I remember when, like, because the world's total that I needed last year was one kilo more than I've ever done in my life. And I was just like, how am I ever going to do this? And so I literally, I actually I snatched really well. So it was just like, I, I needed, I think it was a 105, so I was just like, you know what, I'm going to open on it, like, just <laughs> put it on the bar, and so I, it, yeah, I ended up, I, I got it, and I was just like, what now, and I, <laughs> Angie's like, that's it, like, just, I'm like, just one more Angie, and she's like, do you really, if you go for one more, do you have the energy now that you've just cried and got yeah, all excited, yeah. and like, yeah, but just, like, knowing that you just need that little bit more. Did you get it? I did, yeah. Yes. <laughs> like, um, I, did, no, I, didn't go, I didn't go for the second one. Oh, you didn't go for the second one? Oh. I, no, I didn't go for the second one. I'm like, you're right, you know. But yeah, like sometimes like that, that little bit of like, like a, you know, a great reward can really encourage lifters to just um, put aside that fear of the weight or the number that's on the bar and just like, just go for it. Definitely, definitely. Like we had a, um, a couple of our junior lifters to um, compete at the qualifying comp for junior nationals yeah. uh, last weekend, and we're like, should we do this comp? We could win three hundred dollars, but we just competed the day before, the weekend before. I'm just like, guys, it's three hundred dollars. Like we, like, you don't even work. Like you could, yeah. <laughs> you could earn three hundred dollars yeah. for lifting. Yeah, um, might as well. So yeah. do so, it and have fun. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So having that incentive there just tries to. Um, get people along and, and lifting those heavy weights and, and be competitive. And that's it too, right? It's going to bring you know, more competitive and, and higher level athletes into the sport as well, yep. right? Um, and I think, you know, we've spoken a lot about it's kind of one of the good things about CrossFit is the exposure it does give Olympic weightlifting. And if all of a sudden, you know, at grassroots CrossFit, if you're, if you're offering $10,000 as opposed to like a bag of protein, yeah. like if you're going to train for one of those events, which one are you going to train for? 100%. Right? So that might be a really good place to, to wrap it up. Sweet. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any questions? So just yeah. for the mic. Um, so the question is, what kind of stress management techniques does, does Erica utilize? Thanks, Raquel. I mean, it's, don't get me wrong, it's, it, it's been really difficult. Um, the biggest thing that really helps me is breathing. Uh, so sometimes I just get really overwhelmed and I just start crying. Um, but then usually I've, you know, like, you know, Angie or Brock, like, you would just be like, just breathe. And like, they, they're really, um, help me in calming down, so take note. And, um, but I think the... Um, Angie wants to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, yeah, it, it, is, it is really difficult. Um, and uh, it is something that is probably more for me like an everyday stressor that I have to deal with. Um, and so um, also where the, one of the things that really helped me overcome all my problems was actually, um, I'm someone who, if I don't sort of try to uh, resolve the problem, I'm gonna constant, like even though I don't think I'm thinking about it, it's constantly in the back of my mind. And I don't, sometimes I don't even, like, you know, Brock will be like, what's wrong? I'm like, I've got no idea. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, like, just something's wrong, I just can't stop it. But just taking the time to actually sit down, work out uh, possibly what, factors are causing it. Um, I then do like a, um, uh, there's a word for it, but you know, you work out your positives and your negatives, or um, you need 
it, it's better if you have like um, sort of like a a judge, so uh, someone external, and you go and they're like, why why are you feeling negative about the situation? And then they also help remind you of a of a um, con- like a an opposite positive factor to that same. Uh, statement that you just make and then you, you keep doing that against everything that you're struggling with and um, having having an external person just sit there and go yeah but what about this um, and so I had lots of um, issues that I needed to I needed to deal with um, that um, was all like just constantly in the back of my mind and without actually working through them I really sh- like personally um, I really struggled to just be able to move on and and just just find peace like just not be working in my mind um it's exhausting too right yeah so exhausting Uh, but at the end of the day like there is there are lots of methods and different methods work for every like different people um but uh, i think definitely for me i i had to seek help um because i just couldn't work it out on my own and without um, I suppose just um, them. So I saw a psychiatrist and a psychologist. So number one, just being going, like just just to be like, yes, you have anxiety. Yes, you have depression. Um, was like, oh, I'm not crazy. Like I'm not a psycho. Like just that was a big thing. But then yeah, actually working through the problems um, was the biggest thing that helped me in general day life. Um, but. Yeah, when it comes to um, like certain situations like competing, it's just what works best for you. So there are just um, so many different things that you can do. But yeah, breathing was a big one for me. And yelling. And yelling. <laughs> <laughs> breathing, yelling, um, yeah. And, and having the support, reaching out. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Any others? Perfect, we might leave it there. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thanks, Erica. Thanks for coming down. It's not, it's, I mean, this is massive. Um, like, you know, for me, it's just to, to still have people um, interested in my lifting after 20 years. It's exciting for me, and I know that, you know. Just getting even started coming based to the on your <laughs> projection, yeah. Like, yeah, so I'm, I'm always for promoting weightlifting, and I just really appreciate you guys actually being interested yeah awesome huge thank you no worries and thank josh as well because he's been <laughs> cheering in your corner since day one so. Amazing. yeah like, it's um it was really funny like when when we first caught up like yeah absolutely no no idea we hadn't met um but yeah it was just really exciting to have someone who was so passionate about weightlifting just come along and um just promote mm. um just, just into the dms josh just, <laughs> just sliding in <laughs> but like you know and, um, for like when, whenever we go on international trips, we're always like, oh, uh, you know, weightlifting platform always comes up. Like, so we're um, all the top lifters in Australia. Just um, we we feel it makes us feel feel special when you know you post a photo of us. Well, that's, that's, like, oh, that's, that's what I cares. want. That's what I want to happen. Is I want I want those lifters to feel like they have they have the support and not just from the weightlifting platform mm. but from Australia mm. and and if they get it if, if we get comments on the page if we if it makes them follow you guys and and be invested in what you guys are doing then um, you never know where that can take you um, that's where sponsorships come along and that's where you potentially look at becoming a professional athlete and stuff like that so um, yeah, I just I just want more people to be invested in. So in do it fast. Yeah. 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 Do it fast. <laughs> so yeah, so, um, but yeah, definitely from Australian athletes, we really appreciate everything you do. Oh, awesome, thank you absolutely for awesome. <laughs> Especially like volunteers, that's great. Beautiful, thank easy. You. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Great. Thank you, guys.